A very good evening to everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to give it a few seconds for everyone to just settle in. Um, a big welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us for this great talk. Um, today's talk is all about space. And uh, if you're like me and you studied humanities and you don't know a lot about it, it's still going to be very interesting uh, because this one is about why we should all care about space. Um, I'm going to uh, kick this off right away. May I please invite uh, Mr. Alex Ellis, uh, the British High Commissioner to India, to please come and deliver the welcome note. Alex, to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edri, and a good afternoon or good morning to you all. Um, I am Alex Ellis, the British High Commissioner, uh, and I wanted to thank the British Council, first of all, for setting up one more of these great talks um, about a fascinating subject. Um, uh, and I, I have the honour and the pleasure just to introduce the kind of the main speakers. So first of all, uh, Professor Carol Mundell. Now, uh, she's Professor of Extragalactic Astronomy, Head of Astrophysics at the University of Bath, holds the Hiroko Sherwin Chair in Extragalactic Astronomy and is a Fellow of the Institute of Physics. And she is a world leading scientist. Uh, uh, it's customary in the things to read out long CVs. I I'll keep it short, but it is uh, outstanding. And she is proof in a way both our speakers are proof of a very obvious point about science is that it is global. Um, in other words, excellence exists in many parts of the world. And one of the tasks of people like me um, and the British High Commissioner or indeed the British Council is to connect excellence together to deal with really big and complicated problems. And Carol will tell us a bit about one of the, several of those uh, shortly. Um, I know as well because uh, she's at the moment, I think you're the International Science Envoy, aren't you now at the FCDO? And Carol uh, was the chief scientist in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. You can ask her what that means in practice. Um, but actually, it's um, she was incredibly useful and important when COVID kicked off. The application of scientific method and understanding and connections. One of the great things about science is globality. It actually involves a lot of connections across the globe became very important in dealing with COVID. And there's a whole, If uh, I, I can only commend the institution of, of chief scientific advisors actually uh, and different government departments. Um, and that was really a lifesaver um, for uh, the British government during the heavy onset of COVID. Um, but she does a, 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 lot of, a lot else besides, and, and she'll talk to you about space today. Um, uh, I also work with Carol a bit. Uh, uh, on the bits of science which look at defence and security, uh, which is also a very relevant part of the scientific community, a contribution to the UK government. Um, uh, my last job, I was looking at uh, our sort of overall strategy and spend for um, our international policy uh, in a document finally published called the Integrated Review, which uh, of course immodestly I recommend to you. Um, but one of the interesting things in it is how strongly science and technology come out as one of the bases of uh, the UK's international uh, policy for the next decade ahead. And that is not by accident. Carol and others were fundamental, instrumental in, 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 in that. Um, it's also uh, a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Somak uh, Ray Choudhury, uh, who is the director of Inter University Centre for Astronomy and Astrophysics. And he's our guest moder moderator. And he'll come, as it were, sharing his expertise and knowledge from an Indian perspective and talk about the landscape of the space studies in India. Uh, he's a scholar in astrophysics, uh, PhD from Churchill College, University of Cambridge, which I think was also where the founder of ISRO studied, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, uh, Vikram Sarabhai. Uh, so uh, a good lineage and again, that further proof about how knowledge works across boundaries as well. Um, and he's worked in the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics USA. Um, uh, and that uh, again, it's I, I noticed in both your CVs, a bit of the United States is one of the world centers of excellence, which indeed it is in your area. And I think one of the things we need to do is to build across those links which exist between different countries. So uh, just a couple of uh, other remarks, if you'll excuse me. Um, uh, I would say the cooperation in science, including cooperation in space, is one of the areas identified by Prime Minister Modiji and by Prime Minister Johnson in the roadmap which they signed at the beginning of May. Um, I think there is a lot each country can learn from each other. We are certainly experiencing that in COVID. Um, uh, and I think we can, there's a degree, uh, uh, quite a lot which we can learn from each other in space. I think space policy is a very interesting area in the UK at the moment because having left the European Union, we're kind of just reassessing exactly how we want to go about doing it. Um, and that is a kind of good example of opportunity, I think, which which we have between UK and India in the, uh, in the uh, years ahead. Space is complicated because 
it both requires, I guess, exceptionally complex knowledge and understanding. And at the same time, it's becoming an area of cooperation, but I'm afraid also competition and potentially contest. And actually how you manage all of those things, I think is very interesting and, and difficult. And I can tell you from the point of view of public money, because I had to look at this quite carefully. One thing I've learned about spending of money and anything on land is quite expensive. Anything in the air is very expensive. Anything under the sea is very expensive. Anything in the space is very, very, very expensive. And anything really underwater is also very, very, very expensive. So it's both important and complex, but the investments you have to make in it, you have to think very hard. And it's an obvious area of collaboration, actually, I would say. Um, uh, somebody's actually asked in the, in, the, in, in the questions, you know, what's the vision for uh, uh, UK India cooperation? I think we need to do better at encouraging the flow of people and ideas uh, between our two countries, not just our two countries, but certainly our two countries. That involves things which are a long way from space, like visa policies in, and visa operations in both countries um, and how we make sure that those work as well as they can. I'm really encouraged by the way that the number of visas which we have offered to Indian students is up 30% this year on last year. India comfortably second, uh, China still first in the number of uh, student visas offered by the UK. And that is really important. Uh, uh, and what I would also like to see, and I know the council is working on this, is uh, to substantially increase the number of Brits who are coming to India. It's kind of too often be thought of as one way. And actually, I think there's a lot that can be learned by Brits coming to India. And that's quite a small number. And I would really like to increase that over the next few years. And actually, the new Turing scheme allows us to do uh, exactly that. Um, I, I uh, both of the professors can say why each other's nation is brilliant at space uh, science, and, and they are. Um, uh, and uh, as I said, I think there is a lot which we can can learn from that. But you know, we have to apply, we have to increase that cooperation for space. But if you look at some of the other really big problems which we have to face in the world, um, of which climate change is a very obvious one because of the Glasgow. Um, uh, with the Glasgow summit coming up in a couple of months time that requires deep scientific knowledge and uh, then cooperation in order to be able to deal with those problems, just as is the case with COVID. Um, uh, it's, you know, as I sort of think about kind of the, serum, the fantastic example of the Serum Institute manufacturing of the AstraZeneca vaccine, that starts by publicly funded research. Um, actually, um, it's important to remember that, actually, you know, that is really important. So government and the public and the private sector have a very important role together as the companies in different countries uh, to enable the kind of speed of response. And one of the astonishing things about COVID is the speed of response um, uh, and just how much you can do when you get everyone lined up trying to deal with a particular problem. And that is very exciting, actually, um, if you look at some of the other really big problems that we have. I think it makes us all hungry uh, to do it in other areas as well. Um, uh, and that you've got to pick your you've got to pick your, your issues, as it were. Um, so uh, I'm really glad that uh, 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 Carol is speaking. Um, uh, Professor Mandela is speaking. Um, I want I would hope the people who are on this are thinking about how can they contribute? What do they want to do to increase that knowledge? Uh, between uh, uh, the two countries in ways which help each other, but also have a global contribution. Because I think one of the things about the UK-India complementarity is it's a complementarity which can actually work not just for our own advantage, but to the benefit of countries around the world. The sorts of innovation which we can bring together, I think, uh, can have global benefit. It certainly does in the case of vaccines, and I hope it will in many other areas. So if you're listening, you're thinking, I quite like to go and learn a bit in India. I thoroughly recommend it. There is nothing like learning outside your own environment. Uh, it is something which I think everybody should do uh, and challenge themselves to go somewhere different because you just are so much more capable when you see the world from another place. Thank you very much indeed. and Enjoy the talk. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, thank you for setting the context so perfectly. I think uh, we cannot wait for Professor um, Carol to start, but I just want to give some quick housekeeping rules before we begin. Um, there's a small uh, question box on your screens. You'll see a small kind of a, a bubble with a question mark. That's where you put in your questions. So I urge all of you to hear the lecture 
and then feel free to put in some questions around you know what um, what the professor presents on uh, because we're going to have an interaction after the presentation and uh, professor shomok and professor carol will be in conversation and we will pick up questions from the question box and uh, and 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 uh, professor carol and professor shomok will go on to answer those so it will be a really great interactive session we really want to hear from you we want to know what concerns you and uh, what you find interesting about this topic so please do put in your questions on that note professor carol over to you why we should all care about space Thank you so much and it's a great pleasure to join you all today and I think Sir Alex put a wonderful context there for me and he's really set the stage. So what I would really like to do in my talk is take that context that Alex has, has put out um, you let you think about both the UK and India as two great science superpowers and it's a particular pleasure for me to be in conversation with Professor Shomak because we worked together almost 20 years ago so I think what underpins all of this is friendship and understanding and as Alex said solving some of the, big, the biggest problems that face our species and our planet but I will come on to some of those problems and how we might tackle them towards the end of the talk but to begin with what I'd like to do is ignite your your passion and your interest and show you how inspiring humans can be what we've achieved um, in understanding the world around us and the universe and I'll give you a quick whirlwind tour of the universe and I'll begin fairly close to home and I'm hoping that um, sharing my slides is going to work here I think everything's for, for me my slides aren't moving on Aitra, I don't know if if you can see it from your side it's not it's not okay. moving, uh, Carol, but it's we there. Had everything, we, it. we had everything set up. <laughs> it's ha it's having a little bit of a sleep. <laughs> I think it'll just take a second to come alive. Um, but uh, thank you, everybody, for your patience. We're, we're going to get this done because we've already practiced it a few yeah, we times. We can't launch humans to other planets, but... Uh, <laughs> Digital connection is one yet to, to still work on. I wonder whether I should unshare my screen for a moment. Would that be helpful? You could try that. Yeah, okay. let's let's try that. Right. Let's try again. Yeah. Maybe you could just let me know when you see my screen. I will. I will. Absolutely. And thank everybody for their patience as well. I may have to do this talk by interpretive dance. <laughs> Thank you everyone for waiting. Um, we're already getting some questions in, so that's really <laughs> we, may, we may do it all by a fireside chat instead. I have some beautiful pictures and a few movies to show, so I'm hoping I can get this to work. So from my side, it's sharing. Uh, nothing Is yet? Is it? Nothing yeah. yet. No, no, no. We can't see anything yet. Okay. Um, we may have to go to our backup slides at your end. I think so. I think I, I think we'll do that. Um, Joydeep, are you are you happy to start sharing, please? Yep. Let's do it. OK. <laughs> can we see the screen now? I yes. can see the yes. screen, yes. Let's go to okay, present mode. Good to go. Just let me know when to go to the next slide and I'll do That's it. fantastic. So I'm going to be like Sir Patrick Valance and Professor Chris Whitty and say next slide throughout all of this talk. I'll try and make this smooth. I have an awful lot of talks, so uh, so I'm going to have to ask you to keep up. Um, but yeah, the next slide is actually um, a very uh, orange picture um, of the sun. So next slide, please. Could I have the next slide? I'm not sure if that's coming. <laughs> We're having problems with our technology. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't want to show. It's going to be a secret picture. <laughs> J, 
So they just if you click. Ah, that's them, it. That's wonderful. Yeah. It's really fantastic. We're so I wanted to start with this because this is the sun. Now it's not a, a picture that one normally sees. So I should say right from the beginning, you should never look at the sun with your eyes. You should never look at it directly. You certainly should never look at it through anything like a lens or a telescope or a magnifying glass because you will you will blind yourself. And this is a very special picture taken by a solar satellite and it has a special filter. And what you can see here um, are the charged particles that are flowing out from the sun. It's called the solar wind. And when we have flares on the surface of the sun, these charged particles can zoom across space and actually impact on the Earth. Um, and so space is already, you know, it's very clear from this picture that space is a hostile environment. The reason I really wanted to share this picture, though, um, was because of a story when the solar wind was first discovered. It was a, a, a scientist called Parker, and he wrote his paper and he submitted it to an eminent journal, the Astrophysical Journal, which we still publish in today. And a very famous Indian astronomer, Chandrasekhar, who you should look up and read about his life if you've not heard of him. Incredibly eminent, he won a Nobel Prize and he did his PhD in Cambridge and he's a, a huge name in our field. He was actually the editor of the journal and when Parker sent his paper in saying I've discovered this wind of charged particles from the sun, it went out to referees as we do in our field and other scientists read the paper and said we don't believe it, this is rubbish and they rejected the paper. But Chandrasekhar as the editor went through that paper himself and he went through all the mathematics and at the end of the paper he said I can't see any problem with this paper and he took the decision to publish the paper and that was the discovery of the wider interaction and the, re the, the relationship between the sun and our planet. So that was a huge piece of insight from a great, a great scientist. But the sun is just, to astronomers, it's a fairly normal main sequence G-type star. And um, of course, it produces its light and its energy through nuclear fusion. And that's something that on the Earth we are desperately trying to discover how to do in plasma uh, particle accelerators on the Earth. If we can actually learn how to produce nuclear fusion on the planet, we will solve our energy problems. But we're still very far away from understanding how to do that in our terrestrial labs. But the star, this star is just a regular star and there are billions of stars in the universe. And in the next slide, please, um, we'll see an image of a galaxy. This is a spiral galaxy. It's very similar to the galaxy in which we live. Our, our galaxy is called the Milky Way and we live about two thirds out from the centre. And galaxies like our Milky Way have hundreds of billions of stars. And so you can start to see how very quickly scale increases in the universe. But of course, our galaxy is just one galaxy of many in the universe. The next slide shows a small patch of the sky and there are literally hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. So you can do the maths, you can figure out how many stars there are, how many planets might be typically around a star, how many stars in a galaxy, how many galaxies in the universe. And that gives you the, the huge order of magnitude of the number of planets that must be out there. And so again, keeping in mind how very special our planet is and how we want to preserve that uh, for our life and for the, the sake of other species as well. So on the next slide, We'll zoom into a little patch in the sky here. And of course, astronomy has always captured the hum human imagination. If you're in somewhere dark, you can look up at the night sky and see the wonder of the stars. You can see planets moving across the sky as bright spots that move. And I'll show you a little bit about how ancient astronomers did that. But this is a telescope picture from um, the Hubble Space Telescope. This was taken, this is possibly the deepest photograph ever taken of the sky, the so-called Hubble Deep Field. And the Hubble Space Telescope stared at this re relatively unremarkable patch of the sky for many weeks. And what you can see in this very beautiful picture is an awful lot of physics. So you can see blue galaxies, young blue galaxies. You can see red and dead galaxies. You can see galaxies that have been disrupted and torn apart, the pink and purple ones. And all of this is actually physics. So in our labs, we understand how atoms work. We understand how to build spectrographs, how to measure the different colours of the light. And we can actually do some astrochemistry in these galaxies. We can also measure how the atoms and the gas and the stars move, and we can use our understanding of the laws of physics to actually weigh these galaxies. And then ultimately we can measure the expansion of the universe. And so we can do all of this in modern day. But of course, we didn't always know how to do this. Next slide, please. We've got a huge amount of technology. So with the Photographs that I showed you just came from the visible part of the spectrum, um, but if we look across the whole of the electromagnetic spectrum, we've got the very highest, high, highest energy gamma rays, which fortunately do not penetrate the Earth's atmosphere, and we have to fly satellites above the Earth to actually catch those highest energy gamma rays from space. Similarly, X-rays, as you might use when you go to hospital to check if you have a broken bone, right through to ultraviolet, then visible light, which does of course reach the ground, and that's what our eyes are most sensitive to, through to longer wavelength infrared and long wavelength radio waves. 
So I think we live at a very special time and both of our countries have incredible facilities that we've built, we've developed on the ground and we've launched to space. And this, as Alex said at the beginning, is an international collaborative effort. Many of these facilities cannot be built by one nation and we all work together to try to solve some of the big questions about the universe. Next slide, please. And of course, we're not the first people to do this. This is a photograph of a cave painting, an ancient cave painting that it was thought was painted about 15 to 17,000 years ago. It's in southern France. I visited this one time on holiday with my family. You can't see the actual cave now because it's all protected, but they have an exact replica um, of the, the cave paintings. And when they were first discovered, of course, they were remarkable. It was incredibly well pre um, preserved. And the scientists at the time, the archaeologists, thought that these were pictures of livestock, which would have been very important to ancient uh, humans who were who were living at the time. And it was actually a German archaeoastronomer who realised that some of the extra markings on the cave might be more interesting than just artwork of the day. And what he realised was that this was not just a picture of a bull. It's actually a picture representing the stellar constellation of Taurus the bull on the sky. And just just above the bull, above his, uh, the horns and to the right, you actually see the Pleiades star cluster. And I think this is incredible that this is the same sky that we're looking at now. And if you look in the bottom left hand corner, you see a little line, four black dots. And actually, I asked the guide when we when we visited, do you know what these black dots are? And she, she didn't know what they were. And I wonder, I can't prove it, but I do wonder whether that is a planet in our solar system moving across the night sky relative to the fixed background of distant stars. And this may have been ancient man starting to map planetary motions in our solar system. I'll never know, but that's my speculation. Next slide, please. And why this is important is because this was really how some of the laws of physics were discovered. So ancient astronomers were looking at the night sky. And in fact, you know, I should say that Indian astronomy over 5000 years ago really underpins most of modern astronomy. The Greek astronomers were learning from the Indian astronomers and so were the Chinese astronomers. And so we have much to, to thank our, our ancient Indian colleagues for their, their curiosity and knowledge about the sky. Copernicus was quite heretical in his day and he thought that the sun lay at the centre of the known universe. Universe. And of course, religious teachings at the time were saying really that the Earth was the centre of the universe. We now know that's not the case. Somewhat later, Galileo came along and actually started to exploit the modern technology of the day. So the telescope had just been invented and he did much more development on developing optical telescopes. And of course, famously, he used the telescope to look at Jupiter and he saw the moons of Jupiter orbiting around Jupiter. And again, this got him into quite a lot of trouble. The church's teachings at the time were very much that the Earth was the centre of the universe. And he said, you know, the evidence, I can't deny my eyes. So this was really for me the beginning of the scientific method. He had experimental data. He could see other bodies orbiting around another world and therefore he had to reject his belief system at the time because the scientific evidence told him that something else was true. A little later on, Johannes Kepler came along and he really discovered the empirical laws of planetary motion. And he, for me, is the birth of the big data era. And he mined a database, a database um, that had been set up by an, an, another astronomer, Tycho Brahe, who had painstakingly mapped the positions of the on the night sky of planets as they moved across the sky throughout his lifetime. And he wrote these numbers down on paper all over his house, apparently. And he spent his life obsessed with trying to find patterns in these numbers. He didn't succeed, but Kepler did. And it was really finding those empirical patterns in the data that helped him to understand what the empirical laws of planetary motion were. The reason this was groundbreaking because was because for the first time he could predict the future. So that would have seemed like magic at the time to be able to say, not only do I know where the planets were on the sky last night, I'll be able to tell you where they are tomorrow night. And again, that's the birth of empirical science. You take some data, you find an empirical law, and can you then predict or have a testable prediction that we can then go on to test and prove that our hypothesis is correct. But it wasn't until Isaac Newton came along and he discovered the universal laws of mechanics and gravity that we understood why the planets orbit the way they do, that it's actually the gravitational attraction between the sun and the planets and the orbital angular momentum that the planets have that keep them in orbit around the sun, stops us falling into the sun and stops the planets flying away. And we now know that all of that angular momentum is probably related to the formation of our solar system right maybe four to five billion years ago. So really the, the point of this slide is to show 
show you that by looking at the night sky, scientists over many generations discovered the underly underlying laws of physics which govern our work today and govern our lives today. So we now understand gravity, we now understand how to bank roads so that we don't drive into fields and we, we, we put an awful lot um, of that physics back into our everyday lives. Next slide please. We have the next slide, please. Yeah, I'm trying. Uh, it, <laughs> it is just frozen. Okay. So. <laughs> one. one? That's perfect. So Thanks. coming, uh, coming, you know, forward in time, of course, you know, Newton's laws of gravity still stand in our everyday lives. And that's that's how we understand the laws of motion. But of course, when you go to more extreme systems, we then discovered that actually there was a bigger law of gravitation of which Newton's laws are the special case. And of course, this is uh, the famous law of gen general relativity um, discovered by Albert Einstein. And I wanted also to mention Emmy Nerva here. She was a very eminent mathematician at the time and she worked in Germany, but unfortunately, at the time women could not be paid in universities so she worked for free. The apocryphal story says she had to work in the basement because she was not allowed to go to the higher floors of the physics department where the men worked. Um, I don't know if that's true but it's um, a pretty terrible story. Fortunately not the way we live nowadays and it was really Emmy's work understanding symmetries that helped Einstein solve the final parts of putting his equations together. He had some problems, he had the right concepts but he hadn't quite cracked the maths and it was really collaborating with Emmy that helped him to do that. And so in the centre you'll see a little equation um, this is the encapsulation mathematically of the general theory of relativity and in simple terms the right hand part is really shown in this picture this is the part that says that matter and energy tell space-time how to bend on the left hand part circled in blue that part of the equation tells us that space-time tells matter and light how to move so together we have an entire combined general theory of space-time and this tells us how light travels in the universe it tells us how space-time deforms because of gravitational forces and ultimately how space can can move and how it can ripple and really these this equation is deceptively simple if we wrote it out in longhand this is physics code if we wrote this out in longhand, we would have 10 independent second order non-linear partial differential equations. So that's quite a mouthful. And in fact, scientists today are still trying to solve these equations using supercomputers to try to find solutions of these equations that will predict other physical phenomena that we can then go to test to see if they're real. And at the time, the only three and still today, the only three analytical solutions that were fine to these equations um, really showed us something fundamental about about the universe. So the first solution to the equation predicted that the universe should be expanding and we've proven that that's the case experimentally and again that was a Nobel Prize winning discovery. The second predicted that black holes should exist so theoretically mathematically these black holes should exist in nature. This was a, a very strange idea at the time and people thought it was a bit exotic but the math stacked up and I'll show you through the rest of this talk that we now accept that we have much experimental evidence for the existence of black holes. And the third testable prediction that came from these equations was that when you deform space-time, when you collide massive objects together like two black holes, you will actually disturb space-time and produce what we call gravitational radiation. These are small ripples in space-time that emanate across the universe. And I'll show you at the end of the talk that for the first time humans have discovered these, which is hugely exciting. And India will play and will continue to play a very important role in that groundbreaking science. Next slide, please. So I said that black holes were one of the three testable predictions from Einstein's theory, and that's really where much of my academic work um, has centered throughout my scientific career. Um, so what is a black hole? We hear about them in pop popular literature, we see them in science fiction, in movies, and simply put, black holes are a region of space inside which the pull of gravity is so strong, nothing can escape, not even light. So you can see why they're a good, good subject for science fiction. They're quite simple. We think they're produced either by the death throes of massive stars, when massive stars get to the end of their lives, maybe two to three hundred times the mass of the sun, and they collapse. They can't support their weight under gravity anymore, and they collapse down to black holes. They're a few times the mass of our sun, um, and they're a few miles across, so actually quite small, compact things. At the other end of the extreme, we have supermassive black holes, which are a hundred to a billion times the mass of our own sun. They're about the size of the solar system, and they lie at the heart of massive galaxies. 
and we think that they are very important for the formation and evolution of galaxies. And we've now discovered a population of medium sized black holes, which we think are the missing link. And we don't yet know properly how to form those, but we're discovering, discovering many of them. Next slide, please. So I said that a black hole is a region of space inside which nothing can escape, from which nothing can escape because the pull of gravity is so strong. So, but I've also told you that we know there are black holes across the universe. So how can you see a black hole if light can't escape? Well, there are five really exciting ways to do this. And the rapid rate of, of discovery that we've had in our field over recent years, I've had to update this talk almost every time I've given it, where I've said, well, we may discover this. Oh, we have discovered it. So it's a very exciting time. The first first way is actually if you overfeed a black hole. So in the same way that we have planets orbiting around the sun, if you have a black hole at the center of a galaxy and you start to feed material onto it, all of that can't actually fall over the event horizon and disappear. And actually you start to heat up and that material starts to shine brightly. So we have cosmic indigestion. We can also use our understanding of the laws of gravity to understand the pull of that black hole. And again, I'll show you some examples of the black hole actually pulling stars around the corner with its gravitational force. The third one, as I say, is black hole birth. So when a star gets to the end of its life, it can die in very violent ways. So that catastrophic collapse and birth of a black hole. Again, I'll show you some experimental evidence of those. And then, as Einstein predicted, if black holes collide in the universe, it disturbs space time and we can detect those ripples like a pebble being thrown into a pond. We can detect those ripples um, millions of years later. And then finally, perhaps, you know, the most um, exotic is actually imaging the shadow of an event horizon of a black hole. And that was done very recently. So I'll show you examples of all of those as we get to the end of the talk. And just these three panels in the bottom, these actually do come from um, the movie Interstellar. Uh, if you've not seen that, that movie, it's a Christopher Nolan film. It's, it's a great film. Um, the left hand panel is the one that was used in the movie. The right hand panel is the one with the real physics in it. But there was real physics in that film, so it's really exciting. It's not just science fiction. There's some, a bit of science fact in there too. Next slide, please. So let's start with cosmic indigestion. This is a galaxy in the southern hemisphere. It's called Centaurus A. It's one of those big red and dead galaxies and it's cannibalized a dusty gas rich spiral like galaxy like our Milky Way. So the dark patch across the middle you can see is actually the dust and gas from that cannibalized galaxy and the bright bulge in the background of the stars in the big galaxy that's cannibalized the Milky Way. And in the center we think there is a supermassive black hole but we can't see that with our optical telescopes because the dust and gas block our view. But if we go to a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum and we use radio telescopes. Next slide, please. We get a very different view. And this is incredible. These jets of radio plasma, though, this is a false color image. And what we're seeing here is light being emitted from charged particles spiraling around magnetic fields, very similar to the kinds of flares that I showed you coming off the, the sun at the beginning of the talk. And what this really showed that this is the exhaust material from a central supermassive black hole that's trying to cannibalize some of the material. And these are the longest continuous fluid flows in the universe. They stretch for millions and millions of light years and we don't yet know how to produce those. We're still studying in our labs with our particle accelerators how to make these long lived jets. We can make them for a tiny fraction of a second and then they disperse. So again, there's some really exotic physics here. From my perspective, they give me a probe right down into the center of this galaxy to understand the physics of the black hole and ultimately circumstantial evidence that there is a black hole there. Next slide, please. And the way we think these are produced uh, is something to do with magnetic fields as well. Um, and any students on the call, if you are ever in a science talk and you've, you've missed the point of the talk or maybe you've fallen asleep, um, the clever thing to do at the end of the talk is scratch your head and say, I have a question, what about the magnetic fields? It's very, very difficult to understand magnetic fields in the universe. We don't know the origin of cosmic magnetism. That's a frontier question. Um, but we think magnetic fields are very important for extracting energy and material. We think that there's an accretion disk of material spinning around the black hole there are magnetic fields threaded through there and these magnetic fields twist up like corkscrews and help to eject and focus that material as it's spewed out from the centre of the galaxy. Next slide, please. So the second way to detect whether there's a black hole is to actually use its gravitational influence directly. And it's now possible to measure the gravitational influence of black holes on the motion of stars and gas directly. So we can actually measure how stars and gas are rotating around a central supermassive black hole and use that to weigh the black hole. Next slide, please. 
This is a movie which is an incredible um, set of observations, infrared observations, telescopes looking at the centre of our Milky Way galaxy. And these are stars that are rotating around a hidden black hole at the heart of our galaxy. And if we zoom in, you'll be able to see one star in particular as it zooms around. Let's wait. Boom straight round. And right at the center there is a hidden supermassive black hole. And by measuring the orbits of these stars very, very precisely over many, many years, in fact, 20 years, it was possible for the scientists who did this, a German team and a US team, um, who actually um, the, the lead authors of those and Professor Andre Goetz, um, she's in, uh, in California, and Professor Reinhard Genzel in Munich, they were actually awarded the Nobel Prize last year for this, this work, painstaking work. They were actually able to measure the Milky Way black hole very precisely and it weighs 3.3 million suns so we, we have our own black hole in our own Milky Way and that's an incredible density so to give you a sense it's 15 billion billion suns per cubic light year which is which is quite remarkable but it's not the most massive black hole in the universe and fortunately for us on earth it's not the most active one either it's not suffering from too much cosmic indigestion next slide please we now think that all large galaxies contain black holes, and we don't yet know why. We know that there's an intimate relationship between the mass of the central black hole and the mass of the galaxy. These are hugely different size scales, so we don't yet know how the black hole knows how to grow to the right mass to fit its galaxy. But we know that there's feedback between them, and possibly that cosmic indigestion is a way to communicate between the central supermassive black hole and the galaxy. So we know that they are intimately related in galaxy formation and evolution, and they help to shape the universe that we see around us today. We don't yet know whether the black hole comes first or whether the galaxy comes first and grows its black hole. Again, a new frontier in physics. Next slide, please. The third way I said to detect black holes, of course, was catastrophic collapse. And here you can see what we call a gamma ray burst. Now, the flash was a little bit, bit quick at the beginning, but that's actually what it's really like on the sky. So we catch these very, very um, rapid flashes of gamma rays. They were first discovered by American military satellites in the 1960s who were monitoring the Earth. So they were looking down at the Earth and looking for countries that might be violating the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And when the team of scientists saw the flashes in their detectors, I'm sure they must have got a little bit of a shock at the time. But very quickly they realised that those flashes were not coming from the Earth, they were coming from the night sky. And so for the next two or three decades, they remained a mystery. We didn't really know what produced these. The reason they were hard to study was because the gamma ray flashes are gone literally in seconds. And in fact, you can see in the top left that flash of a real gamma ray, gamma ray burst swamped the detector for just about eight seconds. So that was really hard for ground-based astronomers to wake up in the night, to go to their telescopes and say, let's go and look and see if we can find some visible light and measure a distance to this object because it was literally gone in a flash. And the groundbreaking discovery then came from new satellites that were launched, particularly a Dutch Italian satellite that made the first detection in the X-ray and found the dying embers of these blast waves. The X-rays lasted for many hours and the discoverers were then able to tell optical astronomers the location on the sky very accurately, where to look and have them point their telescopes. So the first optical detection of one of these gamma ray bursts allowed us to measure the distance. They were so bright we thought they must be in our own Milky Way galaxy, but it turned out they were cosmological redshifts. They were distant objects in the universe, some of the most distant objects. So these are the most powerful explosions we know and the most energetic phenomena yet known in the universe. They accelerate particles to speeds far in excess of anything that we can achieve in our terrestrial particle physics accelerators, and they, they're phenomenally exciting labs to study the extremes of physics. Next slide, please. This is what my team have really made their name doing. Of course, these things are gone in a second. And so we had to realize a, a completely new way of doing astronomy. Traditionally, an optical astronomer will win some time through peer review on a telescope. They'll book their flight. They'll fly out to the top of the mountain. They'll set their technology up and they'll start to take their, their data from the sky. But of course, we couldn't do this for gamma ray bursts. We had to do this in real time. So we started to build a suite of two meter robotic optical telescopes, the largest in the world. We have one in the Canary Islands just off, um, off Spain. We have one in Hawaii, we have one in Australia. We also built one for India that's not fully roboticized, but it's identical. And that was actually built, built in my previous institution in Liverpool in the north of England. So a fantastic connection there again as well, but really, really cutting edge technology. My team then put together some really smart software. So first of all, we detect the trigger from the satellite to say, I found a flash of gamma rays. And our telescopes immediately stop what they're doing, start to turn very quickly to that part of the sky and start to take observations to try to discover if we can find some visible light. Next slide, please. 
We do all of this without any humans in the loop and it's quite exciting. In the middle of the night, we might send an email out to a thousand astronomers around the world to say we found something, give you a hint of, of what we've discovered and we're continuing to take more data. But the big science question that we really wanted to answer was what powers these huge explosions? If we can figure out how to do that in the distant universe, maybe we can harness some of that energy on, on Earth. And the big question again was, what about the magnetic fields? And so we were, it was very difficult to measure magnetic fields. And the only way we could do that was by measuring a very special property of the light called polarization. And so my team have innovated and, and built these really nifty little cameras. We've called them Ringo, um, 20 Beatles fans. We did, we did not intend to have a Liverpool connection because we actually produce rings with these in our first detectors. Um, but the, uh, the the pun has lasted and that's been, been quite fun. There's also a phenomenal Indian satellite up there at the moment, which is doing these experiments in the gamma ray. So we're starting to put these together and really do the physics of the magnetic fields. Um, on the left hand side is an artist's impression. We'll never have beautiful photographs of these objects because they're point sources, so they stay as point sources on the sky through all, um, all distances and to all technologies. And so these cameras are very special because they let us measure this special light property, a bit like the glare of light that you get on a, on a day when the, the sun is low in the sky and maybe the ground is wet. And we measure the glare of the light and that gives us a, the only direct probe of the structure of the magnetic fields. And we've proven now that the explosions are um, driven by those magnetic fields and they too, like the supermassive black holes, have these jets of material that are beamed out um, and ejected at speeds close to light. So incredibly extreme physics and that's something that we're, we're still trying to understand. Next slide, please. So I said everything that, you know, across the electromagnetic spectrum, we you know we can do all of this probing of physics in the distant universe and testing of our laws of physics on Earth. Um, but the, the, the final sort of prediction of Einstein was really whether when you collide these massive black holes together, you will actually disturb space time itself. And back in 2015, there was an incredible discovery made with this instrument. Now, this is just a huge feat of engineering. These are four kilometer long concrete tunnels. And in those tunnels, a laser light is shone up the tunnel. Simply put, it bounces off a mirror at the end and it comes back to the center. And this goes up and down both of these two arms. And if space time is not rippling, then the light will go up and come back. We know how long it takes for light to travel in a vacuum. And the same will happen in the other arm. But of course, if a gravitational wave is coming through the Earth, as they are right now through all of us, it will start to distort these arms and it will stretch and shrink the arms. And the reason they're at 90 degrees is so that we can see a difference. And if you send light up an arm and it's shrunk a little bit, and the light will come back sooner than you expect. If the arm has stretched a tiny bit, the light will come back later than you expect. And that's really the, the fundamental way we detect these gravitational waves. And to give you a sense of the kind of um, time delay or the, the, the size scales that we're trying to measure in these detectors, we actually have to measure a ripple on a size scale smaller than a proton, which is incredible. So actually now we're starting to have to understand the quantum mechanics of the detectors. We have to isolate all of this from any kind of disturbance. And in fact, the data that, that are gathered in these incredible instruments, you can actually see waves crashing on distant shores. You can see planetary motions. You can see all sorts of other things. So the teams have to extract all of those other effects to really see whether they can detect ripples from space time. And in fact, in 2015, the very first discovery was made. Can I have the next slide, please? This uh, unassuming little plot is absolutely mind blowing to me. I didn't want to share the actual movie of this and the sound file, but if you have chance to look up this gravitational wave on the internet, I, I really recommend that you do. Um, this is the LIGO detector discovery of the first gravitational wave. And it gives a little bit of a sound, a bit like a kind of a whoop, and that's what the coloured um, plot at the bottom shows. And this actually is the sound of two black holes colliding in the real universe. It's absolutely mind boggling. And again, you know, it did result in, in Nobel Prize in 2017. So feat of engineering, feat of technology, and at the ultimate test of Einstein's theory of relativity. And I'm sure in our, in our chat, we'll, we'll raise here India's role in this because India is going to be building one of these very soon. So it's incredibly exciting to have these interferometers now networked around the planet. Next slide, please. 
And the other thing that we, we've done with these detectors is ultimately test um, our laws of, of laws, laws of gravity and combine those with gamma ray bursts. The other way to produce a gamma ray burst is to collide a black hole with a dense neutron star, so the endpoint of a dead star that hasn't made it to a black hole. If you take a single sugar cube of neutron star material, it's so dense that it weighs more, more than a, a small mountain on Earth. And so these objects, we thought we theoretically thought it was possible that they would collide, they could produce gravitational waves, and they would also produce a gamma ray burst, but we didn't have any proof of that. And in 2017, the first proof of that came through. So again, this is one of these gravitational wave chirps, but it takes much, much longer than when we're looking at black holes. This is about 30 seconds. So you hear nothing at all until the very last second, and then you hear a small whoop. Next slide, please. At the same time, a satellite above the Earth detected a very weak flash of gamma rays, and this was the first proof that these objects merging together disturb space-time and also accelerate particles in magnetic fields that are beamed towards the Earth. Next slide, please. Of course, it's very hard to find these things. Um, again, if you might press next slide, we might get the, uh, the image up there. This was the optical counterpart of this gravitational wave source, a huge ex an, an exciting surprise for our community. We thought we were still about 10 years away from making this discovery, so everything came together on that one day. That day was also my birthday, so I was particularly excited. And we think these mergers produce something like a third to half of the gold in the universe. So the gold that we have in our jewellery or on our planets, we think some of this is made in these incredible stellar collisions. Next slide, please. And then finally, just to show you that it's now possible to use telescopes around the world, connect them up and use the Earth as a giant telescope to look at the event horizon of a black hole. This was the theoretical prediction on the right hand side. And in the next slide, please, we'll see the actual um, detection that was made with this incredible set of telescopes. Next slide, please. This was the shadow. Again, it was on newspapers around the world in the centre of this incredible active galaxy. So again, one of these ones with a supermassive black hole and a jet of material being spewed out right down in the centre. Um, this was the shadow of the spinning black hole, which again, absolutely mind boggling and a huge feat, supercomputing, maths, technology and engineering. Next slide, please. So we're now entering into a new technological era of astrophysics. We'll be finding these new transient sources across the sky, millions per night, not just one every couple of days. We'll be looking for exotic particles like neutrinos. And we have telescope arrays that are absolutely vast. The Square Kilometre Array, of which the UK and India are key partners, um, is built, being built in Australia and across um, South Africa um, to capture these very weak radio waves from the, the beginning of the cosmic dawn, uh, right through to global networks of robotic telescopes, cosmic ray detectors, and um, both in the North and the Southern Hemisphere, and all of these coming together to combine with gravitational waves where we're looking beyond the light sector and into the dark sector. Next slide, please. But of course, I've told you all about looking out, and let me just give you a brief, uh, a brief sense of why we need to look down as well. So with all of this space technology, what we've also been able to do is observe our own planet. We need to understand the system in which we're all trying to live and survive. And of course, satellite technology has been critical in helping us to understand climate science and also to understand mankind's impact on, on the climate. And Alex said at the beginning that we're hosting this incredible conference in Glasgow uh, just in a couple of months time to try to get the world leaders to come together um, to really look at, we understand that the climate change is catastrophic, that it's human made, and we need to look for solutions to that. And it's really been some of that space um, observations looking down at the earth that we've, we, has helped us to understand uh, the impact that we're having on our planet. Of course, we use those Earth satellites to uh, to help us with disaster forecast and response. Um, so the hurricane that's currently hitting the US, many, many space images showing the course of that hurricane as it was moving towards New Orleans to try to help the people in that city to, to prepare for that disaster coming. Otherwise, they would have had no sense what was about to hit them. And the same for space and terrestrial weather forecast. So we get our daily weather forecast meant often from many of our satellite observations and also our aerospace observations, but also preparing ourselves in case some of those so Solar flares actually reach Earth. We have satellites both in situ measuring the flares from the sun and also above the, the, the planet's atmosphere, you know, being ready to predict when some of those solar flares might, might hit the planet. And of course, global satellite navigation, we use this for all sorts of things from precision av aviation to agritech, ag agriculture and agritech. And we could not have that global satellite navigate, navigation system accurately working if we didn't understand the general theory of relativity. It's those equations that are put into the satellites that make sure that they can tell us where we are on the Earth accurately. And then, of course, we use the satellite system for all sorts of things from education to 
telemedicine to connecting here today right through to entertainment. Next slide, please. And of course, we want to explore. We want to go out. This is an incredible image that was taken by the ISRO space um, Im imager that went out to Mars. And so this was the Indian uh, Mars Solar Orbiter 2014. So you can see this incredible photograph of the surface of Mars and actually some proof that the features on the surface of Mars were etched by water and, and by flood. So we know we have we have water on Mars. Next slide, please. And of course, we've all been watching uh, Perseverance. This is the NASA probe most recently um, actually drilled down into the surface of Mars. So you can see here the borehole where the drill actually went down into the surface of Mars. And again, I think this, this is incredible, looking ultimately to bring samples back to Earth to see if there's signs of life on other planets. Feet of engineering and technology. Next slide, please. And so space is exciting. We use it for all sorts of things. But you can see in this plot how the incredible growth of orbit launch has really taken off in the last few years. And so suddenly we're going from a time where it was the major spacefaring nations who would put the odd rocket up and would launch the odd satellite. And we've been using that for science and Earth observation. And now suddenly space has opened up. It's democratized. Many, many people, countries, both amateur, civilian, defense and commercial are now launching satellites. So we again, we can have great benefit from that. But there's real risk that comes with that too. Next slide, please. This is a photograph of the night sky taken by an astronomical observatory um, and these are actually satellite tracks that are, are reflecting light back down to the Earth. So we're starting to see these coming through in our scientific images now. No longer do we have a clear night sky to be able to look at the stars and galaxies. We can start to see this pollution, uh, this, this um, satellite pollution in our images. Next slide, please. And of course, it's not just polluting our images, but actually these things start to collide. So this is a trace um, of a piece of Chinese satellite that actually was impacted by a piece of Russian space junk. They had a very dangerous collision in space, and this was a piece of, of that debris actually streaking across the skies. It burned up as it came through the atmosphere. Next slide, please. And in fact, this is a huge hazard. We know that there are a billion and a, a million and a half objects around a millimeter and the this the space debris cloud is growing and if one of these small particles actually hits your satellite because of the speed it's going in orbit it actually explodes with the energy of equivalent to about a hand grenade and you can see in the far right this was actually a hole that was produced like a bullet hole almost on the international space station when one of these pieces of space debris actually hit the spacecraft and so this is one of the things that certainly our astronauts become very very nervous about when they start to think about you know, being launched and we're thinking about the space debris that ultimately our rockets will have to travel through. Next slide, please. So it's time to act. We need to preserve and use space as a sustainable resource in the same way that we've in some ways failed to protect our oceans and our climate. We need now not to make the same mistake about space. It's an asset that we all need to be able to use, but we, able, we need to be able to share. Space orbits are a limited resource and we don't yet have sensible ways to agree as to how to allocate them and how to share them. At the United Nations, we have the, um, the Convention on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space that was set down again back in the 1960s and the UK actually has, has laid a resolution there to help countries to work together to cooperate to protect the space environment so that we do not use space for warfare and we also protect it for civilian and, and human use and ultimately to protect that, that environment of our planet. Next slide please. So I think we're looking at huge opportunity and also huge responsibility. We have a revolution in astrophysics and space science. We're seeing huge advances in engineering and cooperation. We still only understand about 4% of the universe, so there's much left for other generations to discover. We're taking technology from deep, deep sea and launching it into outer space. And I think that's also very exciting. And as Alex said at the beginning, being good custodians of all of those environments, because this planet that we live on is so beautiful and so special, and it's the only one we've got right now now that's habitable and we need to be good stewards for future generations. Next slide please. So we have come very far in 15,000 years in our engineering and technological development. Next slide please. And the question is what's the next frontier? Thank you. Thank you. You're, Thank you so much, Karen. Um, yes, I just wanted to invite uh, Professor Shomok Rajudri um, to begin the conversation and to moderate the questions. 
And I'm so sorry, we're a little over time as well, Laetri. How, how will we'll do this? It was fascinating. Okay. It was brilliant. It was fascinating. We'll just dive straight into the conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. I think Professor You're Somak is a, a mute. Yeah. Thanks very much indeed, Carol, for such an amazing slew of, of topics uh, all through astronomy astrophysics. Uh, you know, you talked about how much we've come um, in 15,000 years or, uh, you know, uh, a few thousand years, but actually in astrophysics and space sciences, the most, most of this has, has happened in the last 100 years. And if not, um, in the last 50 years since uh, space has opened up a lot of these vistas to us. Um, I just want, before we get on to the questions, I just wanted to make a couple of uh, uh, observations on, um, uh, on on astrophysics in general, but also uh, the connection between the UK and India in this. Um, uh, just like the UK has been involved in almost every aspect of, of uh, uh, astrophysics and space sciences, um, India has uh, two, and, and you can see the, the gen my generation as well as the early generations of, um, of Indian scientists, a lot of them have been trained in the UK. I'm, I'm sitting here at the uh, Ayuka in Pune, uh, Indian University Centre. Uh, this was established uh, 30 years ago by Professor Jan Nalikar, who's trained in, in Cambridge and was a lecturer there. Um, um, I myself uh, studied in Oxford and in Cambridge, and then I taught in, at, at Birmingham for a long time. And of course, the, the people who were responsible for setting up this infrastructure of Indian science, Homi Baba and uh, Vikram Sarabhai of atomic energy and space sciences were both um, from Cambridge. They were both faculty in Cambridge and then they moved to India when India became independent. So uh, there's, there are deep connections between the two countries in, in, in science and technology in general. Just to start from the, the general relativity and black hole physics that you talked about, actually just after the um, general relativity was published by Einstein, you know that it was published during the First World War and in German. And the English speaking world did not know much about uh, what was happening in German journals. The first translation of Einstein's paper into English was done in Calcutta in India. I by, didn't know that. <laughs> I am both an Emin Saha and that translation went over to Eddington and others in England through India. And okay. since then, there has been a deep tradition of, of relativity in India. Uh, Vivi Narlikar, uh, J.V. Narlikar's father was Eddington student. and. Um, Another great example was uh, my, my teacher in Presidency College in Calcutta, uh, Omal Kumar Rai Chaudhary, who, whose equation, Rai Chaudhary equation, formed the basis of, of Stephen Hawking's thesis. And, and mm -hmm. later on, the work on singularity that Hawking and Penrose did. In fact, when I first went to attend Stephen Hawking's classes as a student, he asked me whether I was related to Rai Chaudhary. <laughs> with and, and, and so that is a long tradition is now culminated in this research on gravitational waves. Um, uh, Vishweshwara, uh, was one of the first people who actually modeled the, the collision of black holes and uh, that grew a great uh, gravitational wave community in India and now we're about to build the third LIGO in India actually in the state of Maharashtra where I'm sitting right now and uh, and, and LIGO India uh, will I hopefully begin uh, you know being being built this year and will take us five or six years so uh, the entire technology of of uh, this uh, not just the theoretical bit but the but the, the technological bit is it, being developed and uh, a large chunk of it will be built actually in india and so this is something to look forward to when i was a student i went uh, to england to get trained in astrophysics i, I first encountered astrophysics in oxford as, as a special paper etc cetera, etc cetera. now um, it's there in all all, all universities uh, in England as well in in the UK as well as 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 well as in India and and the scope is opening up in an amazing way in the last uh, a few years and that's something that that's that's worth keeping in mind. Also, from the Indian point of view, India in the last few years has gotten into large international projects with in in a, in a way that there wasn't there before. When I was a student, India was not part of the international scientific community in experimental research in physics, in chemistry, in biology, in, in astrophysics. And now we are part of LIGO India, we're building it. We are part of the 30 meter telescope that's being built in Hawaii with uh, four other countries. And we're part of, as you said, the SKA, the square kilometer array where UK is a partner and it's headquartered in the UK. So um, that these are huge, huge projects. These are these are billion dollar projects, which, which India is a, a very big part of. And, the people on, on from India, the people who are going to actually use these the youngest people are in high school now, and they are the people who are listening to this talk. 
Absolutely. So they are the people who have these things to look forward to because they will start, the TMT will start working in 2034. The SKA will, you know, take off really at the end of this decade. LIGO India will start working in 2028. So these people are being trained now and they, they have this to look forward to and I, I envy them because when I was in their place, I did not have this to look forward. <laughs> Yeah, and, and absolutely. So, I agree. I agree completely. So, Mark, connect, well, I, mean, I think uh, those connections are incredible. And so, I think on the radio astronomy side as well, they're as strong as the black hole ones. I mean, you know, Professor Govan Swarup, who established, the, you know, the, the GMRT and, you know, was very closely related. I did my PhD at Jodrell Bank. So, again, I see those 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 long links. Which I, I was so the next because we, when I when I taught in Birmingham, I sent my students to work with the GMRT here, which is just just here. I mean, I'm sitting I'm working Pune. with the GMRT right now remotely, looking for my gamma ray bursts. <laughs> Absolutely. So they're so well connected. The telescope you talked about, uh, uh, which was built together with the Liverpool telescope, mm -hmm. was built together in the same place in Liverpool, John Moores. That telescope was ordered by Ayuka, where I am sitting now. It's actually 100 kilometers from here. And the picture is on the wall right behind me. <laughs> we and have to I, do some I, new I, collaboration I, together. <laughs> these collaborations are intimate and they have led to some really amazing collaborations, both on, on the ground and in space. In space, if you look at the, the ISTRO um, um, projects that are going on, ISTRO launched AstroSat six years ago, uh, which is a, um, a, a very good astronomical satellite. It had UK, colla UK collaboration with the University of Leicester. Um, we have currently uh, University of Southampton uh, working with us. We have a PhD student uh, from the UK working here. Uh, and on, on AstroSat, um, we have now looking forward to the next ESO missions, the one that will deal with exoplanets, that will deal with uh, cosmic microwave background, all have UK collaboration. So these, 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 uh, these uh, synergies are, are wonderful. And, and uh, that, that also means that the students in both countries can work together and the academics can work together. Absolutely. So and I, I think I, that collaboration, you're absolutely right. And that young generation, that's I think how, you know, as, as senior busy academics as you and I are, and we have management and other duties, you know, that for me is what keeps my brain fizzing when I work with my young people, when I know I can send my students to work in your group. And I think that builds that understanding and the long-term friendship. So you end up with multiple homes, you know, wherever you did your studying and your research and you go out, as Alex said at the beginning, you live and work in a different country, you learn a different way you take those skills back to your home but you will always have those connections and I think that you know the UK India collaboration and that friendship has been there for so many generations big science is generational you don't do it for two weeks and then stop and do something else it's it's generational it requires stable long-term funding it requires our governments to support that and to see the benefit back to our security and our prosperity and I think at times of you know global uncertainty and friction and when people maybe get you know a bit upset with one another or politics are difficult I think that's where the scientific friendships are stable and long-standing you know you don't need to pay that much attention to the politics if you can keep on doing the science and, and, and answering those big questions and sometimes like with COP26 you are then able to bring those world leaders together whatever their opinions are of one another at a personal level and say we need to think about bigger things because we actually are thinking about saving our planet and this is an existential crisis and we just see that warmth among the countries saying help us all get together and solve of these problems and I think as Alex said at the beginning you know the Covid crisis was exactly the same much of my government work I've been doing calls with governments around the world helping them to understand how we set up our science advice mechanisms in government how we've drawn out into those cross and interdisciplinary scientific environments bringing together virologists and medics and public health experts and statisticians and physicists um, to try to understand how to protect our people how to understand this strange virus that has devastated you know both of our countries in terms of loss of life but sharing that learning with one another, you learn something, you share it with us, and suddenly we can move much more quickly together to solve these shared problems. The great thing, I mean, the, the, we did the same thing here in, 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 the, in the COVID crisis. Uh, it was amazing to see how the astronomers in my institute rose to the, um, uh, the, the challenge. Um, we took part in the National Ventilator Project. Uh, our data scientists uh, developed the apps that Pune uh, Municipal Corporation used for contact tracing. Yeah. We did all the data analysis to show how things were spreading. So this just brings us to the next point, which is the interdisciplinarity of our subject. Our subject just requires, because it, 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 it is so vast, and in, in general, uh, we, we try to bring different desperate bits of information together to understand 
things we can't really touch, really. That's right. <laughs> you know, in a, you know, so, you know, uh, other biologists can go into a lab and touch their things, right, and, 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 and see and, 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 and change their experiment. We need, that is why we need so many different kinds of skills in order to do astrophysics and space science. And a lot of the young people here uh, ask questions, what do you need to do to become an astrophysicist? Do you have to study physics, math? Actually, you can do almost anything and come into astrophysics as far as uh, the technology is concerned. So all kinds of engineering, for example, we need. Yeah. We need, uh, you know, electrical engineers, mechanical mm -hmm. engineers, computer scientists. We need uh, mathematicians, statisticians. We need absolutely. Yeah. Chemists, it's a very diverse field. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, and I think for me, what what I've learned working in government, communication is also a really important thing. So you do you do have a passion or you have a deep specialism, and you say, you know, I'm an electronic engineer, and this is what I'm good at. You will then work in diverse teams. So you need to be able to speak about your expertise without using jargon. You need to have other people understand what you're doing, why you're doing it. Then you connect. Then you have those diverse teams that really solve problems. We have some great questions. I mean, we it, it is amazing that we have 183 questions in the in the oh, chat. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, but I'm going to I, I pick a few and and see if we can um, you can you can answer them sure. and I can help uh, uh, chip in. But uh, some of them are very very smart questions. Some of them are very basic questions. But um, to the audience, let me let me tell you that I'm going to pick questions that are related to today's talk. There are many questions that are to do with lots of other things. So Shruti Shatta Shah has actually asked a wonderful question. He says, you said nothing can escape a black hole, but how do you then see gamma rays and X-rays coming out of it? That's a brilliant question, and I should be clear about that. So we see the light from material that's close to the black hole, but not over the event horizon. So once you go over the event horizon, that's the last chance of escape. But what happens when material gets close to the black hole and it's orbiting very quickly, the material rubs against other bits of material and through friction and viscous forces starts to heat up. So some of the light will come from that, that heating up, and some of the light comes because there are magnetic fields threaded through that external material. And those magnetic fields will get twisted up and they will start to extract material away from the black hole. So the material that is shining the light that we detect with our telescopes is the material that just escaped the death, um, death spiral over the event horizon. So it's almost like a tracer of there being a black hole there. So it's a good job that the, the black holes are not great big cosmic vacuum cleaners. Or you're right, we wouldn't see anything. So you're not seeing anything from inside the black hole, but it's very high, hard to hide a black hole because the stuff around it gets very Exactly, hot. it has a huge impact on its environment. And I think really that the only way to see what's inside a black hole is when they collide and we start to detect the gravitational waves because there's an awful lot of physics encoded in that little light trace that the, the wibbles of space time that we detect is ultimately the way we want to try to understand what's what the inside is and the makeup of things like um, neutron stars and how, what, what's inside them where we again, we can't see with our light telescopes. Let's go to a very, very different question. You talked about space debris, and of course, that's a big problem. But uh, a lot of people are, are, are um, asking about uh, the danger of asteroids and the potential that they carry to, to destroy humanity. So what are we doing about that? So what we're doing is actually monitoring the sky and we have, um, you know, great telescopes that are very wide field and they can monitor the sky. If we can actually see one of these um, cosmic bodies coming towards us far enough in advance, because we understand the laws of physics, we can actually measure and then start to predict its pathway. And we can then measure the probability that it will be a problem for us. And I think that also relates to why space debris is a problem and why the pollution, the light pollution that we get from these satellites on the sky is also a problem because those telescopes are looking for these asteroids and whether they will be a threat to the planet. But of course, the telescope's view is then blocked by the flashes of light that we get from man-made satellites. So we start to get a confused view. If the sky is clear, we can see these hazards coming and we can predict and we can start to protect ourselves. But actually, if we don't notice them, it's the surprise um, near-Earth objects that are then a, a real threat to us. And I think that's also the reason that we need to really think about keeping that space environment clean. So uh, there's, uh, going back to black holes, there are loads of questions on black holes, as as uh, we expected, of course, because a lot of people like. But um, so th there's a question that's been asked by somebody who hasn't put their name saying, uh, can black holes end? Can black holes be destroyed? Yes, they can. So again, this goes back to the work that you mentioned, Shomak, about you know, Stephen Hawking and whether black holes can evaporate. And the idea really is that, um, you know, as the, as the black hole, the black holes can grow, they can accrete material. But there's also an idea at the very at the surface of the event horizon, because the energy um, fields are so dense there, that actually you can get particles produced. And if you get um, a particle, that, a photon of like, if you like, very high energy splits and becomes a, a particle and an antiparticle, so a piece of antimatter. That falls in 
into the black hole, you effectively are almost adding negative mass. I know that's not that's not a very good way to describe it, but you're kind of subtracting from the black hole and the other particle accelerate and um, ex escapes. So the idea that Hawking came up with was that that black holes could ultimately evaporate. But the, the cosmic black holes that we have, we think that can't happen over time scales shorter than the edge of the universe. So we wouldn't actually see them. There was some fear that when the particle accelerator CERN and the Large Hadron Collider was being built uh, in Switzerland and there was some popular ideas that maybe, you know, they would have energies that were so big they would produce tiny little uh, micro black holes that would then swallow up Switzerland or the whole of Europe, which of course fortunately it never happened and we thought well they'll probably evaporate faster than we can, we can see. Yeah, but also I mean, you know, uh, Hawking, you know, worked out the, the rate of Hawking radiation. It's actually so slow. I mean, uh, a stellar yeah. mass black hole would, would take 10 to the 60 years or something like that. That's right, happen. yeah. Beyond, but, but, beyond our universe's lifetime. <laughs> Um, um, here's somebody who's obviously read T.S. Eliot and asks, um, how will the universe end in fire or in ice? Oh, well, that's a really nice question. And I, I would actually uh, refer you to Sir Roger Penrose's uh, Conco Concordal Cyclic Cosmology. Um, and he, I mean, again, you know, very, very similar to some traditions in India. He thinks that the universes are cyclical. He has this really nice idea and it's very advanced and we don't know when we'll be able to test it experimentally. Um, that universes, when you, when, if you rewind back to the, the beginning of the universe, it's, we have a singularity there. But he says the maths of that is very special. It's very different to the singularity that you get in a black hole. And when you go close to the beginning of the universe and you unravel the maths and stretch, stretch out space time, you can see that it has some quite special properties. So simply put, his idea is that there were previous generations of universes. And in fact, when black holes collided in those universes, they left an imprint in future universes. So in principle, we should be able to look at the cosmic microwave background. His idea is that we look at the polarized light of that. And then he has some suggestions as to the kind of features that we should see in those maps um, that are the imprints left from previous generations of black holes in earlier universes. It's quite a contentious and controversial idea, but it's exciting and kind of fun to think about. And I did interview him once for a BBC programme and I said, how did you come up with this, this idea? Because it's very exciting. And again, it goes sort of back to ancient, you know, Indian traditions. And how did how did you think about this scientifically? And he just very simply said, well, the natural evolution of our universe is to just a very cold, bleak universe full of black holes. That's, that's what the prediction for our universe should be. He says, and I thought that was kind Kind of lonely and I started to do a thought experiment of what would happen if a single photon of light wandered through the universe what would happen and that's where I came up with this whole cosmology so absolutely incredible and I hope I hope we are able to experimentally prove it con convincingly uh, within our lifetimes but I'm not sure we will. That's fantastic actually uh, when I was uh, a student in Cambridge in Churchill College my master master of my college was Sir Herman Bondi and Bondi came up with some uh, of course uh, as you know in the 50s and 60s with some amazing ideas of multiple universes yeah. existing together, the multiverse. And there are lots and lots of questions on, on multiverses here. And I don't want to get into them because they are quite speculative. And uh, uh, people who have asked questions on multiverses, uh, you know, I, I can we can refer to books that you can read on them. But but again, I, mean, I can make a quick comment, if yeah. I may. I mean, I know that the likes of Professor Stefan Alexander, um, who's an incredible physicist in the United States, he's also an amazing jazz musician. Um, you know, he's worked on these sort of D-brain models where our universe is, is one you know, four dimensional space time and, you know, the Big Bang is hypothesized to be other D brains or so-called membranes that crash into our universe and then produce produce new universes. So I think there's a lot of robust maths there. And again, you know, we have these frontiers. The theorists are often there before the observers and the experimentalists are. What I wait for as an, as an observational astrophysicist is a testable prediction. So I think the math is incredible. I think the ideas are incredible and they stay as ideas and hypotheses until there is a testable prediction that I can build some engineering and go and do the experiment and test the hypothesis. Absolutely. And then, of course, uh, it's hard to know what kind of uh, experiments we would do in, in 50 years time. If you think about the kind of experiments we were doing 50 years ago, we wouldn't have imagined what kind of things we do now. So it's, it's import, important for theorists to let their imagination go wild absolutely. and wait for the right person to come. Yeah, out. absolutely. Excellent. Well, you, you should. Let's let's change the topic uh, uh, momentarily and, and, and then talk about Mars. You showed the borehole. And, uh, and, uh, and, and how we are now digging on other planets. There are uh, loads of questions in the, in the box on uh, the future of this. Uh, uh, some people ask, are we going to be able to mine minerals from asteroids uh, and, and things like that? So do you have a comment on that? 
Yeah, so I think there's an ambition to do that. And um, so there is sort of a space mining community internationally. I think it's very expensive at the moment. But again, you know, I think we have the opportunity to learn for the future. So rather than just going and mining things and smashing things up and then saying, whoops, we've made a mess. I think I would love to have that conversation within, you know, a standards and ethics framework. Um, you know, we know that there are, you know, that there will be lunar bases produced on, on, on the moon. For radio astronomers, of course, you know, trying to escape the, the noisy radio interference of, of the Earth and all that, that human noise that we produce with our, our devices. We would like to go to the far side of the moon where it's radio quiet. But of course, you know, we will have lunar bases there and we will naturally have, you know, satellite navigation and communication systems because, the, you know, humans ultimately who are on the moon will then want to communicate back to Earth. So I think we have an opportunity not to mess up the next planet, but to think now about the plans we have to put in place. The Artemis Accords and that the US have led on, you know, is one step towards that. But again, it's this tension between our commercial interests are human interests and being good custodians of the universe. And on Mars, of course, you know, there are very, very clear and strict rules when satellites are launched there and probes are landed on the planet that we don't go and pollute the planet because we don't want to take our microbes and accidentally leave them on Mars and then measure those microbes and think that we've discovered life on another planet. We have to keep that as a pristine environment. But obviously, you know, there are competing interests. Um, there are minerals out there, but at the moment it's just, you know, costly to go to go to, to, to get them and to bring them back. You talked about the interstellar and the movies. Of course, people are, are I mean, that's a common theme now in, in, in movies and TV series. People are watching Dark, people are watching Interstellar. Um, so there are a lot of questions on time travel and, and wormholes and, and how black holes can be used for time travel. Comment. Again, I'm an experimental physicist, so if you if you show me some experimental evidence or give me a testable <laughs> prediction, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think falling into a black hole is a pretty painful thing to do. I mean, you mentioned stellar mass black holes. You're probably, you know, a few hundred kilometers away. And it's really, really agonizing because the gravitational pull on your feet is so much greater than the pull on your head that you ultimately get spaghettified and ripped apart. So it's a pretty painful process to get very close to a stellar mass black hole. A supermassive black hole, you're not going to feel it. You'll fall over that event horizon. You can maybe keep using your torch to flash a signal back to you your relatives, but they just see a frozen picture of you falling over. You're none the wiser. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's what we have science fiction for. So we can use our imaginations. Absolutely. And and uh, but then there, um, it's fun. It's, it, it's great fun to watch time travel happen. Absolutely. But uh, but I, I hope somebody discovers a way of, you know, um, uh, going on warp speed and, 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 and then going through wormholes. Absolutely. But wormholes do exist in theory. I cannot see myself going through a wormhole in the in the distant future. So um, this this a, a question again related to black holes, which is interesting, and that is um, that is to do with you know you should talked about black holes merging. So why are black holes merging but not colliding? Yeah, so again, you know, it all comes down to angular momentum in the universe. So many of the things that form are rotating and it's actually quite difficult to remove angular momentum from a system. We see this with the solar system. Our planets don't all just fall into the sun. And so actually, when you look at the black holes that merge that produce gravitational radiation, it takes, you know, millions and millions of years for them to get close enough um, that they then feel one another's gravitational force, but they're spinning around one another. And right close to the end, the speed at which they spin around one another is almost close to the speed of light. So they're moving at incredible speed before they finally merge and they have to radiate um, that energy. If you like the ripples in space time, they have to remove that energy for the system from the system so that they can get closer and closer. And I noticed there was a question about three body problem. You have to chuck energy or stuff out in order to get closer to your friend. And I think, you know, you'll know this, you know, better than I will show Mike, that, you know, the big question that we can't answer yet in gravitational wave science is how do these binaries form? So we know that we have pairs of stars and binaries are common. They may be the most common type of system in the Milky Way, but actually, you know, one star might be large, one might be small, one might accrete material from the other. It's actually really hard to make two black holes that are about 20 or 30 solar masses, have them exist together for their lifetime. And they've gone through some stellar ev evolution, blasted their outsides off, collapsed to the center, to then be close enough together to survive in orbit to be able to spin together in spiral and collide. I mean, we don't yet know how to do that. There are lots of theories about common envelope evolution and other exotic ways of doing this, but it's actually physically really difficult to do and we still have to figure out how to do that. Absolutely. And, and forming these binaries are extremely uh, difficult. And, and so that's why we are, we are really amazed that so many are being found. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the other aspect of this question, which is interesting, is that the black hole actually does not have a surface. 
right? It has a it have an event horizon, but there is no. Whereas the neutron star or other stars have surfaces, so you can see stars colliding, neutron stars can collide, but the black holes as they move around each other because they have to get rid of the angular momentum, then merge because there are no surfaces to collide. That's yeah. that's another. So we don't see a signature of the collision in in black hole mergers, mm -hmm. and it's fun because we've now. Uh, discovered with LIGO black hole neutron stars merging. Yeah. If one has a surface and the other doesn't. And the signature is very, very interesting. And I think and, that was my point, you know, when I was showing the gamma ray burst. And, you know, you can ask me whether we know yet what that merger was. You know, the question is, is it two neutron stars merging? Is it a neutron star and a black hole? And as you say, that surface of the neutron star and then the stuff that gets smashed up on its way to merging with the black hole. You're right, we've not found any light signature from black hole, black hole mergers, which makes it very difficult for us to do independent measures with our with our telescopes. We have a distance measure from the gravitational waves, but of course we would love to have an electromagnetic signature, but none are predicted for black hole, black hole mergers. But then when you come to that neutron star black hole merger, that's when all of our fields can come together. So I can look for the gamma ray light. I can measure the optical light. I can see how it fades. I can measure the polarization. I can tell you about black, about new, about magnetic fields. You can tell me what you've discovered from the gravitational wave signal and all the physics of the progenitor that is encoded in that ring down signal. And then maybe we get some exotic particles like neutrinos from there as well. That's fantastic. So um, uh, th there is another. Let, uh, we are we are now winding down. We are coming to the end. But let's let's take a couple more things uh, just to stay with the black hole theme. You showed this fantastic movie of the stars, stellar orbits at the at the, at the center of the uh, the Milky Way. Um, somebody's asked, can you tell us a little bit more about the black hole in the middle of our galaxy and, yeah, sure. and what you know about it? So we know it's a little over three million times the mass of our own sun. In fact, I think um, Chandrasekhar himself had worked on orbits, orbital calculations around the central uh, black hole. We didn't know originally whether it was a black hole, but when you think about the density, how much mass is inside a certain volume, it can't be anything else. If it was a, a cluster of stars, they would have evaporated, they would have been ejected. So it has to be a black hole. We know also that it's a little bit active. Um, so we know that there are some stars that are being disrupted around there. We know there's dust and gas in the centre. And recently the Fermi satellite discovered um, and plumes of high energy particles. So again, these jets, and they actually shoot out north and south or above and below the Milky Way disk. So we live in the disk of the Milky Way, about two thirds out from the center. And these plumes of charged particles go perpendicular to the disk. They were coming towards us. We might we might have some problems, but fortunately they're 90 degrees to where our orbit is. And so we know that the black hole is accreting at a mild level. It is fizzing a little bit. It is able to accelerate uh, these charged particles that then emit in the X-rays, the gamma rays, and, and ultimately in the radio. So I think it's pretty typical. I mean, we are basically in a, a typical galaxy in the universe with a bolt of stars with a black hole. It's not the most massive. And so we might be in a slightly earlier stage of evolution. And if we were able to feed that black hole a bit more and grow it, then maybe it would be one of the, uh, the, the more massive ones in the universe in the future. Great. There, there are some general questions about uh, careers and things. I think we should uh, you know, end our discussion with uh, tackling a couple of those. There's Definitely. a question about um, in uh, you know how can students in India be benefited from uh, a relationship between India and the UK? Uh, mm -hmm. How can uh, Indian students uh, um, be involved in in such work and and uh, um, and and collaborations in research? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. As you say, we already have some really long standing deep links between our two countries. So I think, you know, first of all, be inspired and excited by these subjects. It's clear you are if you're in the audience to this talk. Um, I think, you know, studying, you've got a, a fantastic education system. I mean, you know, physics, computer science, mathematics, that's something I think of in terms of the education system in India. And also those wider skills, as I say, you know, the, the humanities, the arts, all of this comes together. So I think be interested, be curious, you know, speak to your fellow students about what excites them, study um, and have a passion for what you're doing, but also be rigorous. So, so I think that study, the passing of the exams, the reading broadly around your subject. Maths, of course, is the language that we use in physics and engineering and technology. So, you know, if you can access the maths and that gives you, a, a, again, a different tool. Um, but I think also, you know, we're now looking at a huge advance in things like artificial intelligence and new development of algorithms. So all of that 
is again new from our generation where we could go and write a, a piece of code and do an experiment and may, maybe make a calculation. So we're now starting to develop software systems that are so complex and you know we will not know whether the answer that comes out is right or not. So I think again all of the skills, those robust skills around the scientific method, have a hypothesis, design an experiment, test it and then test your assumptions and figure out how right your answer is when nobody in the world knows the answer, when you are at a frontier there is no teacher to tell you yes tick you got the answer right or wrong so you will gradually in your studies get to the point where you hit research where you think i need to figure out how right i think i am and how do i do that collaboratively so i think yeah you know studying and you know working on the subjects that interest you being open to subjects that you don't know anything about you know i wasn't strong in chemistry but i'm now reading about it and i'm learning about it we have astrochemistry so there's lots of intersections of different subjects and then i think you know once you know if you come to university and working with professors like yourself you have those international contacts and you know the systems that we can then tap into because obviously for student mobility funding is important and um, so if you want to share a student and say well send them to my lab you need to have a little bit of money and I think it's those networks of your of your teachers and your supervisors and your mentors and coaches where you can say well I can I can connect you with that person you may not even need to visit initially we're, we're now doing so much digitally and remotely that opens up whole new opportunities of connections and collaboration and so you know I think there's there's an awful lot of potential in the future and as you say, even at government to government level, you know, we have our prime ministers connecting, um, you know, that bridge between the UK and India, which we've always done informally and we've used the systems that are around to do that. So it's wonderful to see that government to government connection where there will be, you know, proper structures like the Turing scheme that will help mobility and help us to, to, to share our connections and grow our collaborations. I know that the organizers are getting nervous, but I, I <laughs> want to bring up a last topic, and that is uh, the question of gender and diversity in, in education, particularly the exchange programs between the UK and India. Mm -hmm. uh, we see that in science in general, in physical sciences, the gender ratio um, is similar in the two countries, and we are trying as much as we can to encourage uh, women to come into uh, the sciences and, and in, in the future of, of, of joint research, uh, the research in this country. I'm sure this is happening in the UK. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I think it's critically important. I mean, you know, my bottom line comment would be why would you why would you waste the opportunity to have 50% of the talent in your team? <laughs> you know, that's just it's insane, it, right? It doesn't make good business sense and it's not right. I think we have lots to learn from one another. I mean, we have a number of initiatives nationally um, that we're trying to help universities, for example, uh, to, to increase their diversity. You really can't be what you can't see. You know, so for me, physics, the, the epitome of a physicist is a white man, and that's not a helpful image. Um, I've got wonderful male colleagues who are white, which is fantastic, but that can't be the only kind of person who does physics. And we need those diverse uh, lived experiences. And also we need to have those role models where you can say there is a career path, you can be successful. And as I've done, I'm using my skills in other areas in government and in science policy during a, a pandemic crisis. So actually, you, you know, you don't just have to be an astrophysicist, although that's wonderful, but the skills that you develop in those sorts of careers are then more widely applicable. So I think diversity really sits at the heart of everything we do. And ultimately, we will not so solve the biggest global challenges in the world. We'll only create more problems if we don't have all of those diverse teams and all of the voices in the room. Absolutely. I mean, I, I just wanted to mention that we uh, very recently had a, a, a science painting competition in which we asked people to draw a scientist. And uh, we had about 300 high school students and 95% produce pictures of a balding old man <laughs> in a lab coat uh, mixing things in test tubes. And actually the reality would probably be a young woman sitting in front of a computer. So Absolutely. I think that diversity exists, the perception is lacking and we yeah. would really encourage um, people of all, all uh, backgrounds uh, yes. to, to come and consider careers in science. Uh, let Absolutely. me hand you, thank you very much, Carol, today. Uh, let thank me you so you much, my privilege. Let me hand you back to the organizers after, after you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Shamok. Thank you so much, Carol. I I think if, if it was up to the organizers, we would still keep going. It was absolutely fascinating uh, and a fantastic discussion. I'll just quickly uh, just wanted to deliver a vote of thanks. Um, my name is Atri. I work with the British Council and uh, for this very enriching discussion, I want to on behalf of the British High Commission and the British Council, thank Professor Carol Mundell for sharing her research and knowledge with us. Um, you have inspired us today and you've given us a lot of food for thought. It is, I think, humbling yet empowering to think 
you know that we are you know just us in this massive world space and yet we 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 must accept responsibility for building a healthy space ecosystem so so thank you for bringing that to us today and i want to thank professor shomok raichaudhuri for the fantastic discussion for bringing in all of these angles and especially for shining a light on how much india is doing in the space i have to say i was a lot of with the things i heard here was was uh, you know interesting and and new for me and i thank you for bringing that perspective uh, and the boundary pushing work that india is doing it's absolutely fascinating to know and i'm confident that we are walking away from this session uh, knowing and caring more about space than we did coming in also want to thank um, alex ellis the british high commissioner in india for opening the session and setting the tone for the evening so perfectly um, and a big thank you to the british council education team for organizing this i just want to quickly uh, tell everybody here a little bit about our work in india especially around scholarships and you know things that will hopefully interest you uh, for those of you who are planning your studies in the uk um, the focus of our work in higher and technical education is towards global collaboration and student mobility international faculty collaboration joint research and sharing of best practice and insights on policy in that domain and mutuality is at the heart of that um, so education and research are one of the strongest pillars of the india uk relationship and this is you know seen very clearly through the uk ery project which i hope most of you have heard of but if you haven't do go and check it out on our website and this has allowed uk and indian higher education institutions as well as government partners like dst uh, to work very closely in the area of higher education um india is now uh, sorry the uk is now india's second biggest biggest uh, research partner with joint research expected to be worth over 400 million pounds by the end of 2021 um and the uk has advanced from being india's fourth largest international research collaborator to be its second globally and uh, its first in europe um a quick note about our work in student engagement that continues with our range of virtual fairs thematic webinars master classes great talks like these um our, our last virtual fair last week uh, engaged over 1800 potential students like you uh, so do please uh, you know catch us on our social media channels on our platforms uh, we have regular uh, facebook lives teams lives about studying in the uk about various subjects like these um uh, and also you can learn about how to apply and things like that so so do be in touch on that um uh, quickly to mention the turing scheme as well the uk is is very keen to partner with india on the turing scheme which is the uk government scheme to provide funding for international opportunities in education and training across the world um and uh, you know we're kind of gearing up for year 2 after a fantastic year 1 um just quickly on scholarships the uk offers a host of scholarships and financial support close to 500 scholarships available across universities uk government and the british council this includes great scholarships commonwealth uh, fellowships and scholarships hornby scholarships charles wallis newton baba achieving the list goes on creative economy uh, and also very interestingly there is a host of scholarships called the british council scholarships for women in stem um so that's exactly what this is about and i that was tantalizing to to end I, on the scholarship for i think for women that. in stem maybe joydeep can uh, joydeep you are muted Yes, I think uh, she's struggling with internet, or there's a power failure. Uh, uh, but uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, just to uh, end uh, what she was speaking. Uh, yes, uh, those scholarships uh, are will go live uh, in next uh, few weeks from now. So uh, I would like uh, everyone to please uh, keep checking our website. So scholarships will be announced from say uh, beginning of uh, October onwards uh, for the next year. so i would encourage everybody to check our website so uh, thank you again thank you professor carol thank you uh, professor rechaudhri uh, for today's session it was a brilliant session uh, thank you everyone thank you have a good day thank you thank you very much bye bye thanks carol bye bye